everyone. Thank you for joining us for our next installment of uh, Yoga for Change, interviewing different amazing collaborators and leaders in the community. My name is Katherine Thomas, and I'm the founder and executive director of Yoga for Change. Um, thank you so much, Betsy, for joining us. I'm really, really grateful for you taking the time. I know you're very busy um, with being in, you know, in charge of Center for Children's Rights and uh, two children now, which is awesome. Um, I actually met Betsy three years ago, probably. Yeah. How old is yeah. um, three years About ago? two and a half, yeah. Yeah, and um, I had a meeting. I had no idea who was going to show up. Like I had a meeting with Betsy Dobbins, but I didn't actually I've never met her before. So it was at a coffee shop um, in Jacksonville uh, near the downtown library. And a stunning woman walked in in the most amazing high heels and the most pregnant belly. And she worked it. And I was like, I have to, I have to get to know this person. She is <laughs> such an inspiration to me. Um, and so I got to know Betsy both through her involvement in the different workshops that Yoga for Change used to do, and then also through our 200-hour teacher training. So Betsy is a graduate of Yoga for Change's teacher mm -hmm. training, um, just a full disclosure there. Um, but why don't you actually give us a little bit more information about who you are and what has led you to founding um, the Center for Children's Rights? Yeah, so um, I was a happy, happy graduate of the 200 uh, hour training with Yoga for Change. Um, and it's interesting because my path has always been headed this way. Um, when I graduated from college, I went out to California and was in AmeriCorps for a year in a hunger relief agency, um, Project Mana in Lake Tahoe. And then after that, worked for a local family resource center where we just did advocacy for any need that anyone walked through the door with. Um, I moved from there to work for the county and provided in-home mental and behavioral health services to children and their families who were involved with juvenile justice, with the child welfare system, um, with immigration, and um, moved back across the country, provided the same thing in Atlanta, and then made the decision um, after getting my master's in social work to pursue my law degree, and that's what brought me to Jacksonville. Um, and I completed my law degree here at Florida Coastal School of Law in Jacksonville. So you have your master's in social work and you're also a lawyer and a 200 hour yoga teacher and a mother of, of two yes. um, and happily married. Yes. And I think I just wanted to say that like, that is the definition to me of somebody who is super powerful in our community. So again, thank you so much for taking the time to fit us into your daily life and to really kind of talk with us about what's going on with Center for Children's Rights. So why don't you tell us about, so when did you find or found Center for Children's Rights? So in my last semester of law school, I um, hosted a symposium on children's rights where we brought together speakers across disciplines for a day long dialogue and conversation about what children's legal rights and needs were looking like in our community. And it sparked for Dennis Stone, who was the president of, of the school at the time, a recollection of an organization in Charlotte, North Carolina, that provides advocacy for children in juvenile justice, child welfare, uh, mental health. And so we got everyone together and we started to have a conversation that there really is no driving um, legal voice for children in our community. There wasn't one at the time. Um, and so we, we just started to think through what would it look like to have an organization that really is dedicated to looking at thing, things through a lens of children's rights. What would it look like to have a persistent voice asking how are we doing for our kids and what can we be doing better. Um, and so through those conversations, we ended up forming the center. Um, uh, myself and several other colleagues really worked as a working group. So from the very beginning, it's been very much a team and interdisciplinary um, effort. Even though I have the, the luck and opportunity to kind of be the lead in that effort, um, it is certainly the product of, of our partners. So Rob Mason at the Public Defender's Office has been extremely instrumental um, in the growth and shaping the organization, as well as Gary Bevel, who was the former ombudsperson um, with the Partnership for Child Health. Uh, Natisha June, who was formerly with the ACLU, was also a close partner. Michelle Hawthorne, who was at Florida Coastal School of Law. Um, and Bev Brown, who's an educational advocate through Three Rivers Legal Services. Um, we all just kind of had conversations about what were the needs that we were seeing, what were the gaps as far as legal advocacy, and where could we um, kind of fit ourselves in to have the most, 
most impact initially. So what year was uh, Center for Children's Rights founded? Uh, 2015, late okay. summer. Mm -hmm. So it was summer 20, 2015. And what was the initial goal of when you founded Center for Children's Rights along with Rob, Gary, Natasha, Michelle, and Bev? So initially it was really just to do a look at what was happening in the landscape to really make sure that we weren't duplicating any services or um, would not be providing something that was already out there. We have two incredible legal services providers in our community. We have Three Rivers Legal Services and Jacksonville Area Legal Services. And so we wanted to have a very strong understanding of what they were doing and really think through what are the biggest needs that we're seeing for kids in our community in relation to their health, in relation to their well being, their education, their safety um, as they navigate the different systems. Um, and through that, we really landed on children in the juvenile justice space. Um, it, it really was a population that has a high level of need that are having a lot of interface with legal systems, but really weren't getting a lot of advocacy apart from defense for their cases. Um, and so we felt like the strongest point of intercept for us was the school to prison pipeline and addressing the unmet legal needs of children in the juvenile justice system, their civil legal needs. Okay, so I am not a lawyer. I'm, I really wanted to be one, but I'm not one now. So can you, you talk about, you what? I said you would have been great. I, well, thank you very much. My grandfather thought so too, but it, you know, he, he was very, he was a big advocate of that. Um, but can you talk about the difference between, cause you said civil rights. And I think that that is really like, I think that is a really good, kind of clearing to make sure we're all talking the same language. Yeah. So can you define a little bit more for me? Yeah, so everyone knows what criminal or delinquent is. It's when you commit a crime. And that's the only instance in the United States when you're entitled to have access to attorney to defend you. So civil legal needs, there's a lot of debate or, or yeah, even within the legal community about what constitutes a civil legal legal need or legal right. It's pretty much everything else from housing, from your rights as a tenant, to your rights as a student, to your rights as a student with disability, to your rights as a student who is homeless, um, to your rights when you are held in some type of secure detention or psychiatric inpatient setting, whether you're an adult or a child. Um, it has to do with your rights to public benefits and if those are taken away from you um, without a reason or proper notice. So it's kind of everything else in life um, where you need someone to help you navigate either making sure that you're okay or safe or that you're having access to something that you need. And so you, you get your clients after they've come in contact with criminal law then, and then to ensure that their civil rights are still maintained throughout whatever sort of incarceration or detention or house arrest like they may be under, is that, is that sort of what you guys are up to? Yeah, so we get direct referrals um, when children have been arrested. And then um, it's primarily around the educational piece. That's kind of the doorway through which kids get referred to us if there's something going on for them in school. Are they getting suspended frequently? Um, are they a student with a disability, but the, whatever they have in place at school is not really working for them? Have they been kind of pushed out of school completely so they're not enrolled or participating anywhere? Um, those kids come to us and through our process, we're asking questions not only about school, but also what's going on for housing, what's going on for their health care, what's going on for their mental health um, care access in the community, that sort of thing. Okay, so can you describe how, because we kind of, I guess we kind of talked about, but can you describe how the Center for Children's Rights has developed, developed alternatives to prosecution and detention? Yeah, so we were fortunate to get some funding from uh, the city through a Safe and Thriving Communities grant that allowed us to pilot over the past year a restorative justice program. So restorative justice is really about um, repairing harm and is is about putting the person who's been impacted, the victim, um, in the driver's seat of figuring out how to make the situation better. Um, this is especially important for our children who are in this developmental stage of learning from mistakes that they make. And I think if we all think back to when we were kids, we all make mistakes. And so the most important thing for us is to learn how to make that right with someone when we've harmed them or we've hurt them. How do we take accountability and be responsible for mistakes that we made? Um, and restorative justice, unlike the traditional justice system, is really a way to do that. It allows the child and the person who's been impacted to come together um, and talk to one another 
and to come up with an agreement about how that that child can make things right. Um, and so we we pilot that piloted that over the past year as a diversion program. So if children have been successfully able to comply with the agreement, then their charges are dropped, which is also beneficial for them in the long term so that they don't have um, that hanging over their head going forward in life. Can you talk about a, maybe a, a situation or experience where that you, you went through with restorative justice and sort of like, if you could give details, if you can, you don't have to share anything you can, but if you could give details sort of of the crime, so we have an, a picture of, um, cause it's not necessarily jaywalking in a, you know, a car. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. pretty, yeah, go ahead. So um, one that comes to mind is a car was broken into and a lot of valuable things were taken from the car. Um, for the person whose car it was, he was less concerned about the material value of the items and more concerned that the young person, because of the neighborhood where he lived, because of his economic, socioeconomic status, that the child really learned not to make that mistake again and that the child really find a way to get on the right path so that he wouldn't get deeper into the juvenile justice system or be placed at risk um, of violence in the community by hanging out with the wrong people. So we um, brought together this, this man who had been impacted, whose car was broken into, and this little boy and his mom. Um, and together they were able to come up with a plan um, that wasn't focused on returning the money for shoes. Although if they had all agreed upon that, that could have been a part of it. But for them, it was more about how do we keep this little boy on track? And so um, the person who was harmed had the little boy volunteer at a barbershop in the neighborhood um, four days a week where he was building a relationship with a person um, that the man knew and had a relationship with that he was helping out in the community and building connections so that even once his agreement was over, um, there was still a touch point for that child and still accountability. Mom and the man who was impacted exchanged phone numbers. So if the little boy is out in the neighborhood and the man sees, he can call mom and say, mom, hey, this is what you need to know. So it really, it really built community around this young person, which is really powerful. Now, does the, the victim comes up with the terms of the agreement for the restorative justice model to work or is it like it's a connect it's like both of them together it's collective so i as a facilitator am really just not dissimilar to yoga holding the space for people to to come and to be present and to engage in conversation and it's really up to everyone in the room who's a part of that circle to come up with that agreement i don't get a say in it um you know whomever the facilitator is doesn't get a say in it it's really about what are what are the people who are involved want to see happen have you seen a, a potential or have you been involved in a one that we, that you felt the victim was asking too much of the of of the, of the perpetrator, if you will. Yeah. I've seen it like, um, are they think, normally sort of level? I think um, questions of restitution are always a challenge, especially for young people who we know are involved with the juvenile justice system. Most of these children are under-resourced. So the reality is that their family often doesn't have the money to repay um, or recoup the financial loss to a person who's been impacted. Um, but again, I think that's why bringing them together to have that conversation um, is so important because often the person who's been impacted may not realize, may realize that it's less for them about um, the money that they, that they lost and more about, you know, really being able to let this child know how they were being impacted, really being able to tell them face to face and really being able to guide and be a part of deciding what that child needs to do to make up for it, rather than a judge or a prosecutor or whomever, um, where the consequences may be less intimately tied to what really is gonna be most impactful and beneficial for the person who's been impacted. So the restorative justice model that you've set up really helps disrupt the pipelines from school to the juvenile and criminal system. Also developing alternatives to prosecution and detention and also promotes community over incarceration, correct? Yeah. Correct. How do you improve the, the conditions of confinement? How does your organization work? Because that's one of your mission statement or your mm -hmm. points that you're working on. So I'd, yeah. I'd love to know more about that. Yeah. So one thing that we do is that we really look at, you know, 
what other connections can we build or push into our detention center? For example, we work together for um, to find some funding in the community so that Yoga for Change could get into the detention center so that our kids who are sitting in detention with little programming, um, with little, little support, uh, have access to yoga. And so um, thinking through how can we build connection, how can we push things into the detention center, and then just also monitoring uh, what's happening for them in detention. What, what is going on with solitary confinement? How often are children being placed into the small five by eight concrete um, block rooms, which we know is incredibly harmful uh, to their health and well-being? Um, Solitary confinement is terrible for adults. It's even worse for children, um, particularly children who have a disability or who've experienced trauma. Um, and so uh, just monitoring, especially if children are our current clients, what's going on for them in the detention center and how do we ensure that they're getting the behavioral and mental support, mental health and educational supports um, to kind of sustain them while they're in there. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's confinement and um, solitary and the box or shoe, I mean, whatever you want to call it, is pretty, it's pretty intense. Um, I know that we had a teacher actually, um, not a juvenile um, student, but an adult who was currently incarcerated, who stated to her that she utilized um, the techniques learned in the yoga class to use during solitary confinement to help deal with the stress and anxieties that come up during that time. And so I know um, for adults, it's really difficult. I, I mean, I can't imagine as a child being um, put in solitary. So I just appreciate that. Um, and then how does Center for Children's Rights really help with the reentry process? So we, um, we are doing a very small pilot where we are accepting referrals for children who are returning home from programs. And then we uh, support them in ensuring that they're getting the educational supports and services that they need, that they have access to the appropriate mental health and services that we're just one more um, kind of touch point and connection for them and guiding what services are best for them, um, what else do they need access to and really helping them overcome any barriers to accessing those things or being compliant with the um, requirements that have been put upon them in the reentry process. A um, quick question from the audience, is it legal to place a child in solitary with dis a child with disabilities in solitary? Yes, so Florida Department of Juvenile Justice allows children to be, um, they, they use a different term than solitary confinement. Um, I believe they refer to it as behavior confinement. Um, and there are um, some regulations around the time and sort of hurdles that have to be um, overcome in order to do that. But the bottom line is, is that solitary confinement is used throughout the state of Florida across detention centers. There's actually a lawsuit um, pending right now in federal court by the Southern Poverty Law Center and Florida Legal Services um, challenging this practice for exactly that reason um, because we know how harmful it is and it's not a practice that we as a community um, can really stand behind, especially when children are being um, in confinement for very long periods of time. Um, I think the average for, for our detention center in Jacksonville is 24 hours um, and children can be held in even longer than that. Um, so it's a very problematic practice and we're very hopeful that the Department of Juvenile Justice in Florida will recognize that it's time to change it. Yeah, 24 hours, that's like, that's hell. I mean, that's, yeah. especially if you're dealing with trauma and you, you know, don't have yeah. tools to assist you. Um, just a comment that I think you may or may not agree with, but solitary confinement is an archaic form of discipline and it should be done away with. And so I think yeah. that um, we, yes, we agree with you, <laughs> viewer, uh, definitely for sure. Um, but I also do understand, like I, yes, but I also do understand sometimes to keep the other individuals in detention secure, you have to separate somebody out because they're causing violence in that, in that instance. And I think there's other ways to potentially behavior modify um, these children. Um, I know that our school districts, and I'm definitely not comparing our school districts to detention centers, but I know by the introduction of calm classrooms, I know from personal experience, another, a lot of individuals who had behavioral challenge children um, or who were having behavioral challenges were able to implement those calm corners and those calm classrooms and allow 
kids a space to get rid of whatever anger or trauma or work through it in a more um, positive way. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, and that's why, that's why I think it was so important. And I think is a really important part of the way that we work and we do advocacy um, in that, you know, we recognize that if they had a better way, they would likely be using it. And so what do we need to do as a community to increase our detention center staff to access to the access to the right supports and services so that that's not the only tool that they have in their toolbox. You know, getting Yoga for Change into the detention center was a start, but pushing comprehensive mental health services into the detention center, increasing um, the quality and level of provision of educational services, um, additional supports and services and training for staff, which also includes raises because Department of Juvenile Justice staff are very low paid. You know, I think it's an issue that we as a whole community really need to look at. And that's part of what we do is helping to paint that whole picture. So that it's not just about the isolated use of solitary confinement. It's really understanding how do we get to here and what do we need to put into place to effectively change it? Because even if the law were to be changed, the reality is, is that if we don't change the culture and if we don't put the supports and services in place to support that change, that change is not necessarily going to happen in, a, in the way that we want it to. And there may be unintended, even worse um, consequences. I had a, and I had an actually really interesting conversation because we're talking about introducing new services um, into a current system that has had its own we roles and ways of dealing with um, children with behavioral challenges. Um, and even the same, like in the correctional system, we, you know, they have a certain way of system because that's what they've been used to because they haven't had access to different programming because it's expensive. Yeah. And I think that when we talk about defunding the police, like that we're, we're not necessarily saying like, I want to take money off your table. I just want to reappropriate the funds so that there's more access to mental health services in a pretty stressful environment. That's going to help everybody involved, not just those who are inside, you know, like in confinement, but instead like those who are being confined and then those who are confining, we're going to help the entire section of population. And I think that's sort of an interesting way to look at it. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I know that we are dealing with right now, complete unrest and unpredictability. And, you know, I feel at times very overwhelmed and out of control and I am not incarcerated. So I just appreciate you know, hearing that way of, of, of flipping the, the little construct or conversation, it, it allowed mm -hmm. me to be like, okay, yeah, I do want, I want more yoga for change programming in because I want correctional officers to have ways to de-stress so that they don't go home and potentially not come back to work or take out their stressors on their family, if you will. Yeah. Because so. I mean, you, you think through just the idea of a child in solitary confinement and what if the responsibility is then on you to be doing that? Well, how, how do you carry that with you? How does that feel for you? How are you managing your stress? So, you know, the only way to change any of that is to do so comprehensively. And so it really takes cross systems, interdisciplinary work um, to make sure that everybody at every level is supported. So talking about your, your current um, work, what is the hardest part of your job? Or what do you feel is potentially misunderstood about your work? So I think, I think the hardest part or the most challenging hurdle that we face is um, because we're involved with children who are in the juvenile justice system or who are experiencing troubles in school, a lot of times um, versus other population of children who may be who people may be more automatically sympathetic towards. You know, with kids who are in the juvenile justice system, there's kind of this underlying assumption, well, they did something bad or their behavior is bad. Like they reap what they sow. And so um, we think that accountability for our kids is really important because it's a prior and process of learning and development. But accountability doesn't necessarily equate to punishment and also, we, we really wanna help people understand that behavior and choices, all kids make mistakes, right? For some kids, the stakes are just higher because the, the kind of net under them is, 
is not as strong. Um, and also all behavior is communicative. So a lot of times our kids um, are having unmet needs or they're experiencing really high numbers of adverse childhood experiences, which we know um, fundamentally impacts them at a cellular level. And so seeing them only through a lens of, oh, their behavior is bad or they're acting out or they're making this choice really doesn't allow us to listen um, to what it is that they need or to make sure that we are responding in a way that is going to help them to learn and grow beyond whatever the barrier or challenge is that they're experiencing. So do you have a hard time potentially connecting with your clients or is it no, so you, okay. You know, it's interesting. There's sometimes when I, when I sit in meetings, we hear a lot that there's a struggle in our community with engaging families or engaging children and young people. And that is rarely our experience. And I, I think some of that is because we use a rights-based lens. Um, we are really looking at what are the core needs that you as a child and a family have? Because if we can't help you overcome the barriers to those core needs, we don't expect you to be focusing on, you know, the school meeting that's two months down the road. If you're worried about getting evicted today, that's the need that we need to figure out today. And that's what we work really hard to respond to. And I think that builds a lot of trust and just dignity because we're, we're able to, um, to listen and to respond to what, what children and families are telling us that they need most. So when you meet with a client, you're, you're figuring out what their immediate needs are, you know, shelter, food, you know, you know, basic needs. I think many of us, um, just assume, I mean, I, I did growing up, like, to be honest, like I did growing up think that everyone had a house and clothes. Like I didn't understand and I didn't really understand or want to, I guess, comprehend the drastic levels of poverty that are in our community. I mean, I just found out about an organization that works with individuals in the Jacksonville community area that are 200% below the poverty line. So they're already considered at the poverty line. They're 200% below the poverty line. I mean, that is, and then, then having that on top of like everyday worries, I mean, that alone is, is stressful enough. And then on top of just everyday worries, I think that we as a community really need to focus on our, our, most vulnerable populations in order to become a better community overall because we're only as good in my opinion we're only as good as our weakest link and i think that we're we've taken advantage of of potential like our gifts and not seeing and not able to really see what's actually happening um yeah. so in that all that being said from my point of view um what do you think is potentially misunderstood about your role or have you been misunderstood or have you had issues walking into a juvenile detention center to try and offer your services or have you had any pushback? So I think because, you know, because we do legal advocacy, which is inherent an inherently adversarial field, um, there's, you know, sometimes naturally a sense that, you know, we are in opposition to or against the other side. And really, we're not always and, and we're not generally because most often the other side is an important piece of our community. You know, for example, the school district. We think that there are things that the school district could be doing better for our children with disabilities and our children of color. That doesn't mean that we think that the school district is bad. It means that we want to help build our school district up so that it can better respond to these children's needs. And so even in our advocacy, we still try to take a restorative justice approach and really try to think through and engage in those deeper conversations of this is what's happening. So how do we make it better? And how do we not only make it better, how do we get at those root causes so we don't have something happening like this again? So can you share some of your potential goals of collaboration with the school district, like what you're trying to accomplish or what you see is needed, um, whatever you can share. 
Yeah, so one thing that we try to do with the Hope Pipeline project, which is our, our advocacy project, is we try to maintain real-time data for the school district. Um, you know, we think that the children in the juvenile justice system are our most vulnerable. Um, so they really paint a clear picture of kind of where the gaps are and how children and families are having difficulties navigating those gaps. And so one thing that we've committed to doing with the school district is producing an annual report to really relay that real-time data to them, um, to include the experiences of our kids and make sure that their voices are really elevated to the school district. Um, and from that data, making very specific recommendations. So, um, you know, for students with disabilities, a lot of times, or students who are suspected of having a disability, there are ways that they can request evaluation to be identified and then have supports and services in school. We think that the process in Duval County tends to take too long. Um, and feedback that we've heard from kids and families, um, even not our clients and from partner organizations, is that it can be sometimes feel like an insurmountable um, process to be able to get access to those services. And we know that if a kid really needs those services, the longer it takes to get those in place, the more likely that kid is gonna be um, likely to be continued suspended or pushed out or get further and further behind in their learning. Um, so speeding up that process, we also think there's a lot of opportunity for um, things like calm classroom, uh, meditation, detention, things that are really bringing mindfulness and really supporting teachers and all school staff from the cafeteria person um, to the SRO in developing comprehensive trauma-informed ways of responding to children whose behavior is communicating something um, while maintaining the safety of everyone in the school. And then obviously, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now um, around equity issues. And so really thinking through in the historical context of Jacksonville, how are we really supporting um, our students of color uh, in an equ equitable way in our school district and how, um, how can we ensure that that is happening um, across all domains from, you know, especially around discipline. Uh-oh, I think you may have froze. Hey. It is. Uh, everyone, this is Catherine on the phone. Um, her, her screen has died, so we've had a technical difficulty. Um, shall I just go ahead and... Okay. I'm, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> So I'm not sure if I'm still active. This is probably my fault because technology hates me. So anytime I'm involved in any technological situation, there's bound to be bugs. Um, I think what Catherine is doing, just in case this is still live, is she's restarting the Zoom and it's gonna try to connect it back to the live stream. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and mute and dark myself just so that you guys don't have to see us navigate um, any technical difficulties. Um, 
while Catherine is working on um, on that, maybe I can speak a little bit about it. Can you hear us? I'm here. Are All you right. there? I'm here. Brianna, yeah, I'm here. Okay, hang on. I'm <laughs> gotta get Betsy. Are you? Can you hear me? Oh, I can yeah. Hear me. Be great. Okay. Bye, Bri. Thanks. Okay, bye. bye. I think we're still like, I think we're actually still um, going. I think so. I think so. I out of my office now. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. Let me just restart. Let me see what we're doing here. All right. I'm here. Are you, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hang on. I'm, okay. Okay. Big breath. <sighs> I was listening to you. I don't know. My, my other computer like died, like just died. And I was like, it happens. It, I was, was saying it was probably my fault because technology oh. always, always oh. weird technology things happen if I'm involved. Oh yeah. We had, okay. So we had a lot of great things. Thank you guys um, for commenting. And um, this is still live. This is what people are like, just so you know, you're still live. So don't like, you know, say anything about, okay. Um, so can you please tell us why, you said yes to participating in the teacher training and what that potentially impacted in your work with um, Center for Children's Rights. Yeah, so I think it was more like me begging you for the opportunity, but I said yes um, because I really believe in the work that Yoga for Change does. Um, when we think about changes that people can make at a core level where they're empowered to be in, in control of that change, um, what yoga brings to people really speaks to that. So it's really about, um, you know, being present in your own body, connecting to your own breath. Um, and yoga for me was very powerful in that process. And what I found when I was an assistant public defender was that a lot of times what I was doing was just trying to help my clients breathe. Um, was just sitting with their parents after filing decisions had been made and helping them to breathe. Um, and so, you know, the more I learned about Yoga for Change, um, just the more impassioned I became about how critical it is to give people um, tools that they are in charge of, that they, um, that they literally hold within their body to be able to breathe in a moment when they need to be able to breathe or to be able to ground themselves down um, to where they are physically so that they don't feel lost in the space of wherever they are. Um, and I had had, a, had an interest in being trained in yoga, but I knew that the only, the only group that was doing it in the way that was the most powerful in our community for, for what I was looking to do was, was with Yoga for Change. And so you started, um, and you're teaching right now, correct? For your different change. Yes. Okay. Yes. And where are you? What are you? Where are you teaching? And can you kind of talk about that? I'm mostly teaching with um, kid populations. I was prior to the pandemic um, most frequently teaching at the Youth Crisis Center, um, which which I really really liked. And you know, it's funny because we incorporate. Um, we incorporate breathing and grounding into the work that we do with our kids and families, giving them little strategies and tools that they can use. You know, So if we have a kid in detention that we know is having a hard time, we're talking to him about dropping his tongue from the roof of his mouth. We're talking to him about spreading his toes out in his shoes um, to really feel grounded if he's feeling stressed out. Um, so even if I'm not in a yoga for change class, we are taking those strategies and bridging them um, to the children and the families that we work with. Do you have one story that you can share about um, a client that will, that has remained with you and that will, you'll never forget um, that kind of inspires the work that you do? It doesn't have to be a happy ending necessarily because my story that has sort of inspired the work that I do, my, my, my student um, actually did overdose. And so um, I know that not all of the stories are really have a happy ending, but that's, again, this him, Matthew Horn inspires me to keep, you know, keep doing the work and making it a better place for all of us, because I know, I know it can work. Um, do you have a potential story that you could share with us? 
Yeah, so one young man um, comes to mind for me. Um, he is a young man with a disability that really impacts um, kind of his ability to regulate his emotions and manage his behaviors. And so even though he was receiving supports in school, it was not the right fit for him. And so what was happening was that he was frequently getting arrested for school, um, for issues at school. He was arrested for hitting teachers. He was arrested for destroying property. Um, and they were all felonies. So um, it had the potential to really um, derail things for him if he continued to escalate in that way and continue to be arrested. Um, we got involved and we shifted what was going on for him at school. And he literally went from multiple incidents a day to one incident a month. And being able to show the appreciable difference of what having the right fit of supports and services made for him was persuasive enough to the state attorney to recognize that this was a kid who, yes, had made some mistakes, whose disability was definitely impacting um, behavior that we were seeing and chose to drop the charges. Um, and now he has gone on to high school He's doing great. Um, and this was a kid who was really on a trajectory to be at risk of being committed to a Department of Juvenile Justice program because he was just so quickly picking up charges and continuing to appear before the court. And without our advocacy to really kind of pause things and figure out what is the right fit of what we need to do, and then using our legal advocacy to work with the school district together to make things right for him. And then also work with um, his defense and help work with the states so that they could understand this child holistically, we were able to completely change the path that he was on. And save the taxpayers money. Yes. I mean, yes. like that, I think that needs to be said because when you teach somebody how to uh, interact with themselves and then also others, and then also a larger community, you're saving all of us taxpayers dollars because it, it actually is more expensive to um incarcerate a youth right i mean is that yeah yeah because you have the educational costs you have the higher supervision costs conditions are are far better for children in djj commitment programs they're not great but they're better than they are for adults in prison um but the costs are really high i mean this right. this past year alone we were just looking over our data and we've re-enrolled 25% um, of our kids back in school. So that's 25% of, you know, 75 kids that we've worked with who now are no longer on a course of dropping out of high school, which we know automatically puts them at lifetime lower earnings at an increased risk of um, continued involvement in the juvenile justice system and increased um, risk of involvement in the adult criminal justice system we've managed to reconnect them to what they need. And for kids, that, that so often makes the difference for adults too, um, but definitely, definitely for kids. So what do you think are your goals for the Center for Children's Rights over the next five years? So we are a baby organization, even though we were formed back in um, 2015, we are a staff of three um, right tell now. Us staff. Pardon? So it's you and then, can you tell it's us? me how? and then LaQuaria Barton um, is our incredible educational advocate. She is a Georgia barred attorney who's gonna be sitting for the, the, the Florida bar. And then we also recruited Melissa Curse. Ah. Uh, from Yoga for Change. Yes. Uh, and she is our new restorative justice coordinator and also overseeing um, the development of kind of a new role or new name for the work that we do, which is really resilience navigation. So that's yes. all that kind of need and resource brokerage. We consider we don't consider that case management. We consider it resilience navigation because really the kids and families that we work with are incredibly resilient. Yes. What they need help with is overcoming the systemic barriers to accessing the things that they need and finding different pathways um, to continue to, you know, exert their resilience. Yes. Yeah. So we, um, five years, go oh, ahead. No, no, no. no. Say, so five we would years. Hope to build, we'd hope to build out our team. You know, we would hope to be able to serve all the kids that need us right now. 
um, with our capacity, we're really only able to serve about 100 kids a year. Um, and we know that nearly 2,000 kids are arrested annually. Um, an additional 500 kids receive a civil citation. Um, and then there are also children in the dependency system um, who we think we could, we could provide support and services to, as well as these children who are coming home from reentry programs. So really building out um, capacity on the advocacy side to respond holistically to the needs of of that entire group of vulnerable children in our community. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, really continuing to expand the restorative justice piece beyond the juvenile justice space into the criminal, the adult criminal justice system and into making um, community-based restorative practices available as well so that the community really has a community held um, way to resolve conflicts that are happening. Awesome. All right, well, we're gonna, I'm gonna scroll up. We have a lot of people who commented it probably when we went, um, when I went incognito for a second. Um, we have, speaking as a counselor, I know staffing students, sorry, speaking as a counselor, I know staffing students properly is all, always a struggle. Our psychologist is overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, I, and then we had a comment about, uh, what is the common misconception of restorative justice and how can Jacksonville residents help support your mission? Hmm. So I think, I think one common misconception is that it's um, is that it's easier on the people who have done a harm. So it's easier on the kid. They're like getting off scot free. Um, you know, it would be worse for them if they went through the system. But actually, um, what we find is that the accountability that comes out of it is just as strong, if not stronger, um, in regards to the agreement. And I don't know about you all, but if I have done something wrong and I have to look the person in the eye that I have done it to and like really own up to it and face it, that is harder than standing in a courtroom where everyone is talking around me and nobody's really talking to me or expecting me to speak to what I did and to answer for it. And so, um, you know, I think that is a big misconception that we need to need to address especially you know like we're in an old southern city like children need to to learn right and do right and restorative justice is one of the best ways that they can really learn and do in a way that repairs the harm and builds relationship and community and so in the next um next couple of weeks we're going to be partnering or next next month or so we're going to be partnering with the jacksonville um urban league to try to push out some basic information um maybe something like this about restorative justice and start to build awareness in the community and really reach out to the community because restorative justice really belongs to the community. So thinking, how can, how can we better engage the community to be a part of this new effort and initiative? Yeah, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what current corrections looks like. And it's easy to sort of like pretend that it's all working correctly just because it's not currently involving you or someone in your immediate circle of, you know, impact, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I do, I do appreciate the fact that there's more information coming out about restorative justice because there's a lot of misconceptions of what it is and what it isn't. Yeah. Um, Betsy, do you keep measure or keep data on the 100 cases you work with annually? And yeah. how has restorative justice had an, in, sorry, and how restorative justice has been a positive impact on the community at large? Yeah, so we do keep data. Um, we actually are working with the University of North Florida Data Science and Social Good Program. So they are analyzing all of our data from this year and we will be a part of the big reveal in the fall, um, which is very, very exciting because data is really important. You know, we, we don't want to be doing something that isn't working. And so knowing <laughs> that what we do is impactful helps us to make sure that we're on the right track and that we're headed in the right direction. Um, so stay tuned, uh, the big reveal will come. And um, restorative justice, you know, honestly, we have held, had very few cases um, this, this year so far. Um, I think we've had less than, less than 15 um, referrals. But what I think the impact that we're starting to have, and I think perhaps connecting to broader conversations that are going on in our community and across our country, is that, um, is that there is a real commitment to looking for different ways to resolve the things that are happening. 
And um, so even for those few families with whom we've interacted um, and people who've been impacted, my hope is, is that the, the word of mouth will begin to travel. And I, I think that's, that's the most exciting part about kind of being on the front end of this, you know, potentially big new shift for our community um, is really thinking through what does restorative justice look like in our community? What does justice look like in our community? And, and what is all of our part to play in that? That's great. Thank you so much. Um, just quickly, there was a discussion about the victim um, and the perpetrator discussing and how Betsy is a, sort of a facilitator of that conversation and really holds space for that and how they engage and talk about um, an appropriate punishment, if you will, to, to a potential crime, um, especially talking about like a barbershop. So definitely look back to that part of the conversation earlier on if you asked a question about um, how the victim engages in the process. Um, Betsy, is there any question that we didn't ask you that you wanted to kind of touch on before we say so long to all our YouTube friends? I don't think so. Thank you for the opportunity to chat with you and share a little bit about, you know, what we're up to. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for saying yes and being on. Thank you for being who you are and for leading a really needed um, service for our community, for our children. Um, thank you for being really flexible when we had our awesome technical difficulty that's never happened. And now my comp my wonderful computer won't turn back on. So that's fun today. Um, and I really appreciate, like, I just appreciate who you are and how you're able to sort of fit into different situations, no matter what, what they call for. Um, so thank you so much, everyone who tuned into YouTube. We really appreciate your time. Um, stay tuned. We are going to take next week off, but the week following, we'll be talking to um, Javin Peterson, who is the founder of Shepherd's Gate Health. Um, they're an organization that's working with the community um, to really identify needs of the community and then to give the services to that community. So we're really excited for that. Um, thank you again, Betsy, and we will see you next time, everyone. Thank you.